Historians would say that America's civil rights struggle officially began around the late 50s or early 60s, which would mean that it has continued for roughly 60 years or so. But most of us believe that the struggle has been going on for much longer than that. My question to you is this. Given all that you have seen, all that you've experienced, the amazing history that each of you have made yourself, what would you say has been the most transformational moment in America's civil rights history? Well, if you come to my library, you'll <laughs> see the most transformative thing that happened on public policy level was the election of Barack. And I worked <coughs> in his campaign. And it was very difficult to go across this country campaigning for him when I had campaigned so many times for other whites like Bill Clinton, like Reverend Jesse Jackson. All of those people, I had learned how to truly be a campaign worker. But back to the early times, it was long before 1957 when her face went around the world. I was one of those that used to go over to the state capitol and see the black fountains and for water, for whites and for blacks. <laughs> and I'm a storyteller. One of my bosses, a little boy, went with him because he was over the boys' training school, Dr. Coggs. And the thing that Granville, who was one of the Tuskegee, was with him. And a little white boy, and that's why they didn't want to start when they're little together, because they would have learned to get together. They started up at the high school. Granville and this little white boy, they, they could read, and they saw the black fountain and the white fountain. And so the little white boy said to Grandpa, I want to drink some of that black water. Do you want some of this white water? <laughs> and they said, yeah, let's try it out. That's how far back I go. My mother taught me don't ever drink a lot of water because you have to go to the bathroom. And don't you ever reduce yourself to going to a bathroom that says black and white. Mm. So I go to the bathroom at home, and then I don't drink no water for two hours before I'm going somewhere, because <laughs> I don't want to use no fountains or no toilets that segregate us by law. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Eckert? Well, um, I'm a lover of history, and I have learned since school, I have learned that there were some slave revolts and I, we were never taught anything about slavery mm -hmm. in any school I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a peculiarity about America that uh, there's an irony in the inalienable rights. It, they didn't say so, but they were talking about white property owners. It's only in modern times that we think that other people should have those rights. I have an understanding of bigotry and prejudice. It's very, very simple that it's the belief that you're more deserving than some others, mm -hmm. that others are not deserving of what you, what you aspire to. Thank you, thank you. Historically, when we think about civil right, the civil rights struggle in America, we've thought of mostly African Americans marching, sitting in, chanting, challenging for our rights. It was a struggle for many years for African Americans and mostly by African Americans. Today, however, given our new demographics, our populations are far more multicultural and multi-ethnic. When we look around, we see many different groups fighting for civil rights. My question to you, why is it that given to a great extent we are all fighting for the same things? We have not found a way to coalesce, to come together and fight this fight as one, because we all know that there is strength in numbers. So what, what would your suggestion be 
to this new breed of fighters for civil rights, um, how can we come together and why have not we not been able to do that so far? I would follow the example of uh, Barbara Jordan. She was a, a legislator from Texas and a very, very talented debater and public speaker. But she was different. She did not practice racial politics. She um, gathered with people who had similar goals and uh, worked with them uh, because uh, there's more power in, uh, in being collegial than being segregated. Well, yeah. one of the things that I always do, and sometimes I'm misunderstood, even back when Daisy Bates had her paper, the Arkansas State Press, and you bought that paper from her after it had closed and brought it back, and she was unable to do it. We have two papers now that are very similar to the Arkansas State Press. One is called Arkansas Talk, and the other one is The Little Rock Sun. Little Rock Sun was originally uh, in the 1800s, but it died down. And in my library, I've got some of all of the black papers that were published. But now, when I go to the Clinton School of Public Service, I carry papers for them, which is predominantly white students. But the lectures there of people who are trying to make the transition or from then to now. So the average age is between 50 and 70. And what I try to do as an empathetic part of my ministry of trying to bring people together is, I share with my white friends as much Arkansas black history as I do with our Arkansas blacks who didn't have an opportunity. When I came to Paul Lawrence Dunbar in Little Rock, it was the largest and the most sophisticated educational institution for Arkansas blacks in Arkansas. And when I got to that school, I had a privilege that very few have had after Paul Lawrence Dunbar was no longer a high school. That was Mrs. Gwendolyn Scott taught Carter G. Woodson's textbook of black history. Mm -hmm. And so I had good black history taught to me at Little Rock High School. But at the same time that we were dealing with that, and I, I graduated in 1950, and I didn't bring it, but I have my invitation that was sent out, just like everybody sends invitation when you graduate from high school. I have my prom invitation, and I have my class. My classmates of 1950, we still meet monthly the last Sunday in each month and have missed that. That's the kind of unity and patriotism we have for being proud to be graduates of. Because we're getting old and 86 is, you know, I got 13 more years and I'm gonna work on that to get to be 100. <laughs> but the bottom line is that we know that we are not gonna be around forever. So what happened is, as the integration changed from segregation, this is the school district's directory of Little Rock Public Schools in 1958-59. I had one of 1957-58, but I was with a group of professional educators and business chamber of commerce, and do you know one of them stole that and I couldn't find it <laughs> when I got through gathering up my stuff? So when you look at this one, it has colored schools, and it names all of the colored schools, and the new superintendent that we have now, he said, oh my God, Annie, you still got that? Yes, I keep it. <laughs> and it had all of the school organizations, white, and all of the Negro. They'd gotten away from colored. And I tell folks, <laughs> the reason why they got away from colored, because as the world was growing, so many p different colors of people. There are people from India, darker than me or any of us. There are Indians darker than me, so they say, we can't use that word color no more. So they start saying Negro, if they had good enunciation. If they didn't, they said Negro, Negro. <laughs> so 
we've gone from colored to nigra, nigga sometimes, and then to African American, and now we're back to want to be called black. So whenever I'm speaking, you know that I always wear black. And why? Because I'm talking to both of y'all. I can't see who's out there, but I'm talking to both of y'all. <laughs> so y'all learn from this Black History Month. Thank you. <laughs> I remember that, that I, my ninth grade graduating class from Dunbar was after it had been converted to a junior high and Horace Mann was built in the eastern industrial section of Little Rock where there was not much population. They scraped off and dug up a cemetery to build a school, a high school for us. Mm. In many places in the South, new schools were built for Negro children. Mm -hmm. But uh, throughout our history in this country, we have struggled to define ourselves. I remember when I was a child, you could have, a, you probably would have a fight if you call somebody black mm -hmm. or say your mama's black. Mm -hmm. But during the 1960s, we took that term proudly and were no longer ashamed of our Negroid features. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, there were some people who had uh, natural hairstyle wigs mm -hmm. where they could take it off depending upon where they were. <laughs> but my hair has been mostly like this since 1964. Mm -hmm. but, um, it may not be obvious, but my hairstyle was a political statement for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, I've had a, a, a very ordinary jobs and the last one I had was as a probation officer for adult felons. And um, I had contact with two probationers I hadn't seen in quite a while. And the reason they looked me up is because there was a warrant out for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, one of them said to me, Miss Eckford, you are a nice colored girl. <laughs> I took it as a, an attempt to compliment me <laughs> because we hadn't been called colored people in so long that it would have taken quite a while to bring that man up to date. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my next question is this. Please. Give us your understanding of why desegregation, integration, educational equity, all the things that were fought so hard for for so long is still not where any of us would have believed it would be at this point in American history. When we look at the demographics of our schools and our communities, are there any one or two specific reasons we can point to and really, is across the board equality and equity realistic in America today? Well, I remember I was speaking, just as I'm speaking to you all, in Hoxie, Arkansas. And Hoxie was a place where the public policy people made a financial decision. They had had, for their colored children, had to be on buses for a long time to go to a school after the elementary. And when the, the Board of Education and the Supreme Court came down with the 1954 decision, that town, which was a majority white town, said, you know, it doesn't make sense fiscally for us to now try to bring them and let them have a school and we have to build a colored school and a white one enhance it and make sure they're equal. So they said it was cheaper to bring what few little black children lived in Hoxie to that one white school. And so they obeyed the uh, decision. But in other places, they were making decisions. 
Well, the governor at that time, I ended up knowing him. His name was Arthur Eugene Barbus, and my husband was Arthur Eugene Abrams. <laughs> and my husband was a bartender at the country club where the decision makers would come and talk about what we ain't going to do and what we will maybe do. And as a bartender, I don't know if anybody out there drink, but when you get a bunch of folks at a bar and they drink, they, they talk. <laughs> and so he had a chance to listen a lot at what the policy makers, we had a group called the, uh, let me see what that, it, it meant 100. It's not the 100 black men, but I'll think of it in a minute, I'm 86. But the <laughs> thing about it is that the um, 100 men, one men, 100 men for the future, that was, that was it, the group. And they were trying to figure out fiscally how to grow Little Rock and keep it, because we had a reputation that we got along pretty good. But this was too much. And I remember my husband coming home from the country club, and I shared that with uh, the Clinton School one time. He said that Mr. Forbes, when he would trust him uh, to make him a drink, he loved margaritas. And my husband made him a margarita, and he was saying, they say the main reason they don't want to integrate is that if we integrate up there at the high school, first thing out now, the white boys and the white girls and the black ones, they'll be mixing, and then we're going to not have white race purity mm -hmm. anymore. <laughs> so that's why they were so afraid of integration at the high school level. So when the Little Rock Nine, they didn't have but two boys, three boys in there. Mm -hmm. And they were nice looking boys. <laughs> and they were afraid, some of them. And so I lived, I've never lived farther than uh, six blocks from Central, doing segregated housing and everything. But the thing that I got to hear, because I've always been an activist, is they were afraid of sexual mixing mm -hmm. would happen if we integrated. That reminds but, me of my history teacher who told us that General Nathan Bedford Forrest, mm -hmm. a, a, a Civil War general, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a representative of the Lost Cause, mm -hmm. originated the Knights of Camellia, the Ku Klux Klan, for the protection of white women. Mm -hmm. Why would whites expect newly freed ex-slaves to behave like white men? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're doing now. <laughs> and uh, when you talk about race, race is a social construct. There's nobody that is all one, one mm -hmm. uh, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I prefer to use the term ethnicity mm -hmm. um, because uh, we now know that the earliest human beings migrated from Africa and that they migrated in different directions and that probably is, accounts for the differences in complexion. Mm -hmm. But nobody is pure white or pure black or pure red, and Asian is such a misnomer. Mm -hmm. Asian is applied to people from India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and some other stands. <laughs> <laughs> as well as Chinese people and Japanese people and Koreans. Mm -hmm. And if you look at them, they all have some subtle differences in their mm -hmm. features. But uh, we're all lumped together as Asians. Mm -hmm. So uh, think about that, that Race is not a biological construct. It's a social construct. Mm -hmm. 
And that's been known for decades. But we still talk about race as though it's something authentic. Mm -hmm. It's not. I remember one of the things that people are so kind to me. Um, I remember when I went to Ghana and I wanted to truly, I'm like Elizabeth, I've always loved history, but I knew that the only world history I ever was exposed to that truly dealt with world history was in Sunday school, the biblical mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. history. So I knew about it from that standpoint, but I wanted to know about it from public policy. And so when I went to Ghana, where that is, according to research, more slaves were shipped out from Ghana than any other place in West Africa to be brought to America. And there's a high correlation between the land and the people. Those people who were selling property, human property, they were investing in something that they wanted to get dividends, and that was money for what their investment. It cost to bring a shipload of slaves across the waters. And so as a result of that, I wanted to, to go to that place and see it for myself. And I remember when I went there to the castle, where that, that's where the it would be called a mall now for human purchasing, that I wanted to lay on the floor where it was 600, 300 women, 300 blacks, men on that other side, that they had them there for to get ready to be shipped out like cattle or like swine. And I thought about the things that people had tried to make me think that if I was classified as black or Negro, I was inferior. Mm -hmm. Well, I had left JFK on a plane going 500 miles an hour, and it took me, the sun was just coming up when I left New York, and it was almost going down when I got to uh, Ghana, but stopped in Paris. And I thought about the people on the ships. What kind of a human could endure having laid on that floor, washed off like you take care of cattle when you're sending them like from Petty Jean. Uh, they had to be strong people. Mm -hmm. They had to be, because the other thing, everybody has strategy. The strategy was when you bought these properties, you bought them so that when you put them on that ship, they wouldn't be able to communicate. Because if you get a bunch of us together, I don't care what color you are, we can come up with a strategy to protect ourselves. Because the first law of nature is to protect yourself. So they made sure that all those people on the ship could not talk to anybody. And I thought about when I was there, how they must have felt when they finally got here, those that didn't die in route and thrown overboard that they came to this land and they didn't have no GPS or nothing to know where you were. But they survived. And so last, two months ago, I got my pack to check to see what my real authenticity is, my ethnicity is, and so I'm waiting on that. But the bottom line is, I also went to Egypt as part of my personal research because I did know enough about world history of where the true civilization had started. And I remember getting on those camels. Man, that was, ooh! <laughs> I almost squeezed that man to death up on that camel, <laughs> going around the pyramids. But I thought about, I met architects from America and everywhere, still trying to figure out how those black-skinned people built the pyramids. <laughs> So I've never felt inferior because I've always wanted to know world history, even starting in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day when I was working for the Little Rock School District, I said, I've come through it, I've taught school in the Delta, I've worked for the Teachers Association for 25 years, 
and they were getting ready for Desert Storm. And the superintendent, who I helped, Ruth Steele, you remember Ruth Steele? Mm -hmm. That uh, they were having a mess in the office about, we had a man that was a service person, and he needed to get his check, because before you went to Desert Storm, you had to leave just like you're going to not come back. Make a will out, make your checks out, your bank things and everything. And so they were down there because it, he's got to leave like two days. And they told me about what was going on. I, I am an activist. So I went down there to see what on earth is going on. So I told the superintendent, I said, what's the problem? He said, well, we can't write no check for him because we write checks twice a month on the 15th and the 30th. I said, well, where are you going to send this check? They hadn't thought about it. They didn't know where they were going to send this check. But those are kind of silly things. When I got through with them and I went on back, they were trying to find me to take his check over there to the Air Force Base where he was going to be shipped out. Sometimes somebody has to think That's how true. stupid stuff can be. <laughs> and I think a lot of y'all are not thinking about it. It's some stupid policies being discussed. But I was telling them, tell them in, the, in our comments, I don't know why everybody having the flu. It might be somebody done sent something over here because we used to have the flu. It was killing as many folks. So I got something so in case one of y'all sneeze, honey. I'm gonna <laughs> well, we are we are almost at the end of our time, but I wanted I have two questions for you all, Mrs. Miss Eckford. I want to ask you. You are, for many of us, the earliest symbol of the struggle for integration and equal education for people all over the world. First, I will ask something you must have been asked a thousand times, and that is, would you today say the sacrifice was worth it? And secondly, what are some other ways that young people who are not natural leaders, they're not going to get out there and march, um, but they want to make a difference. How can they make a difference in some way to help ensure justice and equality for all? I tell young people that, that uh, language is powerful, that their voices can be powerful, and that they are responsible for the kind of community that they have. Because I remember in Little Rock, the normal leadership was, was silent. All we heard were the lawyers and the preachers from the White Citizens Council, but we didn't hear from the Chamber of Commerce people. Uh, we were harassed all the time and knocked about every day. But I remember two students who made a, a tremendous difference for me. I was a very, very shy child. And my last class of the day was a speech class. I would go most of the day feeling terribly, terribly alone and set apart and despised until I got to the speech class, where two students engaged me in ordinary conversation every day as though I were a human being. So what anybody can do is support someone who's being harassed, someone who's being set apart. Because if you don't, for those people who didn't, who turned their backs, I thought that they felt like I was getting what I deserved. I don't ask anybody to try to defend someone who's being battered. But I ask them to support them, treat them as they want to be treated. Anybody can do that. And it is, it is very, very powerful. I'm not exaggerating when I tell young people that they could help someone live another day. If you think about it, some people commit suicide because they are so oppressed and they feel like nobody cares about them. So if you support someone who's being hounded, it will help them 
continue for another day. It's very, very, very powerful. Those two students who engage me in conversation every day in a speech class did not know how powerful that was to me until I was able to tell them 36 years later. In fact, when I first started talking about them, I didn't name them because I felt like they probably went somewhere else to go to college, but that they had family here and there might be repercussions to their families. Thank you, that is powerful that you shared with us. Mrs. Annie Abrams, given your years of fighting the right to right the wrongs of our community, what one word of encouragement would you give to youth who see many of the ba baby boomers and the silver boomers, our efforts as failing or falling short? One of the things, if you look at these, the NAACP that's older than I am, there are some things older than me. It was the safe God that she's talking about. But if you do the history or Google it, now we can Google everything. If you Google this organization, it was not a black organization, it was not a colored organization. It were people who had been oppressed, people who had come to America to Ellis Island, which I love to go there every time. And I went there for 12 years, at least once a year. The Ellis Island immigrants that came there, some of them were the co-founders of the NAACP. But it has gotten an imagery and a brand that is just to fight for black folks. But it fights for everybody to have the right to vote, whether it's at the quorum court or whether it's at the school board. And I've been there when I was running a campaign for the first African American that was on the Little Rock school board and the second one. And when we were trying to get the third one, one of my most liberal friends, white, we were all there huddled trying to do the political decision to find this third person. And I brought up a man named Sherman Tate, Google him. And my liberal friend told me, said, Annie, girl, he too black. Our white folks ain't gonna accept him. Now they accepted T.E. Patterson and Bill Hamilton because they were so fair that we were just getting t television where you could see the school board meetings black and white. And a lot of them didn't know that we had black folks on the school board. But if you all, oh girl, if we put Sherman, they ever have another thing going like it did when Elizabeth and them went. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe my liberal white friend would say that, but she was being honest with me. But she went one step further, Janet. She said, let me tell you, Annie, since we're friends, can we be honest? She said, when I sit close to a black, skinned person. I wear black and white when I'm doing these. I want to know how deep is that black? Is it all the way down? That's what she really wanted to know and had never had a chance to be in the surgery and see that when you get this off, it's just like everybody else, the blood is red. But I've had those kinds of experiences, whether it was with all the fathers when he told my husband and my husband told me, and I told him when he was a lonely man up there at Huntsville, that being black is bad, but being alone like you talked about, mm -hmm. he was alone. And when I was trying to get him to have a second chance, and that's what everybody's entitled to, I called him, I said, Mr. Forbes, I said, this is your namesake. My husband and him got to a point they called each other namesakes. Hey, namesake, Arva Abrams and Arva Forbes. And I said, this is your namesake's wife. And I know that you have been left alone and people don't use you for to speak or nothing anymore. 
and you're so up there by yourself pitiful. Would you like to have a second chance? He said, yeah, how would I? I said, well, Wallace came out and he was the best friend after they almost assassinated him. I said, if you want to come down and say you're going to endorse Reverend Jesse Jackson, that would change history for you. He said, okay, I won't do that. How about I get down there? I said, well, Lord, here I go. I said, let me try to see can I get you a ride down here. So I called UPS, a friend of mine, there was a token in there, but in the high, uh, hierarchy. And I told him what my dilemma was and what my promise of making a difference could be to get him down to Little Rock. And uh, Channel 11 was excited about they gonna have this big story. All the fathers coming to endorse Jesse Jackson. And he called me back, he said, listen, I done had a flat in my old truck. And won't nobody help me. I ain't gonna get there on time when you told me to be there. Can you tell them to wait? And I said, oh Lord, let me see. I called this annoying. <laughs> he got to be there because we're not gonna let UPS be late. <clears throat> and I came that close to changing history of a man that needed somebody to give him a second chance. And the reason I wanted to give him a second chance is because he told my husband, the bartender, that they treated Elizabeth and the other eight bad, but the elite, class white, mm -hmm. treated him just as bad because they called him an old redneck hunky from up there in the hills. So sometimes you think in terms that harassment and discrimination is only against people of color. But I have gotten away from racism Right now, I'm dealing with classism. You ain't been treated bad until you ain't got no green. That's the only thing that matters in America right now. Who has the most green? It doesn't matter whether you're black or white. Some folks don't see that that's what's going on. But in public policy right now, we are having another almost civil war, and it's gonna be another poor folks march on Washington because some folks are discovering we're going to be poorer than we were. Mm -hmm. And when you suppress pain long enough, it's called a revolution. Thank you. And it's a lot of people are suffering. But the thing what I say is that there's always enough people who say we ain't going back. The people who united that she talks about with labor unions was just like the NAACP. Labor unions were fighting for equality of people who were working class people. The NAACP's focus was more on education because education is the passport to the American dream. And that's why I'm so glad to be here. God, I tell you, you good. Look at here, where I'm sitting. At Pulaski Tech. Amen. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Very, very much. Please give it. I truly wish we had more time. I really do. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. I think we are going to take questions from the audience now. I understand there's two microphones that you can come down to. And I understand that the uh, photo collection is still open if you're interested after we leave here. Somebody. Yes. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Mayo Johnson. And I'd like to thank Ms. Abrams and Ms. Eckford for being here. Welcome to Pulaski Tech. And just thank you for your service. Uh, we appreciate all that you've done for all of us. And my question is, being here, and I work here at Pulaski Tech, and you talked about education and what we can do with schools and colleges and universities to bring everyone together. 
Can you all talk about health care and how, when we talk about civil rights, health care and education, and, and there are so many other things that we have to address, can you talk about health care as well? You want to go first? Oh, mm -hmm. go. Well, I consider health as a human right. If you don't have health, you can't do much of anything. We get upset because of the price of medications. I try to look on both sides. I understand how expensive it is to do the research to know whether a drug will help you or kill you. So I understand why the health issue is the issue of today, the flu. There's, we don't, research doesn't give us answers fast enough before something has happened. But also I think about there's a possibility always in real world laws where sometimes they have used drugs out there into the community. Agent Orange was one of the health issues that came back out of, out of the war. And so when I start seeing so much that the researchers say they don't know what to do, and the health professors don't know what to do, I said, now who was smarter somewhere that didn't know that this is a new virus? It took a long time for them to figure out about blood plaza and some of the others, tuberculosis. But one of the things that I remember that research is being done all the time, somewhere. I know the fella who went to Tuskegee and I know that they used some of those folks thought they were getting a drug to help them and they were tested to see and they gave them syphilis to see if the medication they were giving them would work. But they didn't know that's what was going on. And so now we have that they are complaining that we don't have enough money to do the research fast enough to make it possible. And that's what America has been out there trying to help other countries who had greater health problems than we have that were visible. But now we've got to deal with, that's why it's so expensive, malpractice. People I'm scared that if I give you something, you know there was a time 50 years ago, if you had a wreck and the doctor came by, or if you was on the plane, he says, is there a doctor here? Is there a nurse here? But folks are scared to use the knowledge they have for fear that you'll sue them in case it doesn't work. So that's my concern about health. It's a right to live. I'm perplexed about people who vote against their own interest. In West Virginia, uh, uh, coal miners suffer lung diseases and public health care would help them very much but they they didn't want that what do they want you know in arkansas we we are a right to work state and there's very very little union strength in arkansas why is that so that the unskilled will have more opportunity to, to work at low wages. But uh, there's, there are glaring examples of people voting against their own interest. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I always say is Every word that you see got ism on it. Y'all write that down. I-S-M. Ism. <laughs> There's a struggle going between the powerful and the powerless. Think about that. Any other social governments that got I-S-M on them. E-M-O-S. <laughs> Capitalism. 
<laughs> we have that struggle that she's talking about. Why would you get so hung up? But they use the one called racism that teaches one is superior to the other based on their ethnicity. And as a result of that ism, they were both against their own interests. Mm -hmm. Remember what I talked about when we were trying to get integration started? They didn't want to start it at the elementary level because the children would get along. Let's put it up here where we can make enough people mad and say, no, we don't want that. Well, and it, uh, it, I describe my, our experiences not as integration, but desegregation. Right. The district intended limited token desegregation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another questioner. Yeah, uh, thank you both so much for um, everything that you've done to make this a better world to live in for all of us and um, for sharing that wisdom here tonight. I was wondering if you could speak to educational equity in Little Rock today and just what the state of that looks like considering everything that y'all fought for back then, what things look like today. Well, you must have been in a cave <laughs> if you don't know what's going on in Little Rock. <laughs> We have public policy that works against participatory democracy. Participatory democracy is based on this is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And when you start having something that's against the people, having participatory democracy, you're anti-American. And so in Little Rock right now, on the governmental structures. You're supposed to vote for who is going to be in charge of your educational system. We had that. I helped get the first woman on the school board, black woman. I helped get the first black man on there. I told you about that earlier. But now we can't vote on anybody on the Little Rock School District. I remember at the State Department, when I used to go over there, when we had a black teachers association and a white teachers association, and we would have to get together after we merged to go and talk to the State Department of Education about things like consolidation, putting little bitty schools together to make a big school because it was more fiscalist, they thought, in the legislature. But now we got just the opposite, not participatory democracy, but you'll be handed down the decisions about education. And what do we have? We used to have just Pulaski County, North Little Rock, and Little Rock. Now we break it off into little districts because they can still have their board members that they can elect. And so we finna have a revolution <laughs> behind who's at the State Department making all decisions. But I think before the revolution come, I, I hear some echoes in the corner. I think they're going to give us back the opportunity to have participatory democracy in the Little Rock School District. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Is that correct? Do you want to address that, or we'll go to the next question? Let's go to the next one. Okay. Speaking as a regular person, I guess, <coughs> you... Um, are examples of African American history standing out and standing up for what you believe, but wait a minute. It's American history. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> but sitting here speaking to us as symbols of American history. Would you say that African American youth are able to appreciate the sacrifices, losses, and struggles that you went through? In my family, um, and among the Little Rock Nine, we did not talk about what it was like inside school for 30 years. To do so is to walk through pain. I started talking to students in 1999, and I used to cry when I talked about the past. I couldn't help it. I have post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. But um, 
I don't cry now. For me, that is a victory. Well, one of the things that I hope whenever I, and I, my calendar is full for this month, I just consider it the same opportunity when we celebrate we are glad we are Americans for the 4th of July. I feel like it's a Judeo-Christian community when we celebrate Christmas or the subs of that if you're Jewish or if you are from the Muslim faith. I work on trying to understand all of the breakouts of humanity. And as a result of that, I make it my business to go visit the houses of worship that's different from my Judeo-Christian Baptist. And I have people who help me because they invite me to those special occasions. So I think that that's the most important thing is to give yourself an opportunity. When I look at this audience, I hope you become ambassadors to help people to be just plain human beings created by somebody, I won't even say it, or she. I say it's God. But the most important thing is do what I do, and this is my philosophy. Community service is the rent I pay to stay on this earth. <laughs> I don't intend to be evicted from heaven because I didn't pay no rent. <laughs> That's my philosophy. And how do I do that? I adopted the three H's. If I get enough information in my head about how I can make this world better, in my heart believe that all of us are a member of the human family, then I'm here now today working with my hands. So I wrote my little speech. I brought my stuff, and I'm here. And I've been doing this ever since I was 16 years old when I was excited about, I'm going to get the boat. So I'm a person that, everybody here, if you'll just, would you do this for me as my, September 25th is my birthday, and that's the day they integrate. For February the 25th, I, you know, I can celebrate that one as if it was September. Would you try to make sure that they are, 10 people who understand what you understood that we both said, and then that you'll go get 10 folks registered, particularly between now and May, and then in November, that you'll make sure that a felon that's paid the dues, just like when I paid off my car, I got my title, I paid off my house, I got my deed, when they pay off, that's what I tell the governor when he was at my house on the 14th. Governor, if you want to make a difference like I tried to give Forbes a second chance, let's get some legislation passed that don't take the right to vote away from a person because they're going to prison. <laughs> Citizens come here and the first thing they do is take the lessons and get to be a citizen to vote. Why would you take it away from people who were born here, the right to vote? Because that's what makes you a human being in America. You're one of the people when you have the right to vote. So that's my ministry right now. My house is full of folks coming because I help them to get the right to vote as soon as they come back. They give them a suit, $100, and a bus ticket when you get out of prison. I want them that if they can't since they took them away, make sure just before they get ready for a parole to come back out, you register them in prison. That's the best present they can have. <laughs> Keep the suit, I'll find a suit for them. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more, we're gonna take one more question. Did I see one more person? Okay, uh, my question, uh, my... A little louder, okay. I'd like you to speak to the differences in education outcomes. If we say education is equal, then let's just say the outcomes where the black student 
ends up more or less in the alternative learning or at the bottom of the class or not graduate as readily or as with as many accolades as other kids, even with the predominant culture in the school here being black or African American. How do you speak to the differences in the, the grade level or, the, or how they get through and what they go through in order to get through? Well, I brought this. I wear this all the time. Had to graduate. And there's a young man, he's a former Razorback, that that's his ministry. He and Sidney Moncrie, two fabulous athletes, they're working on reducing the number of people who have to go to alternative schools because they didn't get a fair chance in education. The research shows that if they don't learn how to read by the third grade, they're not going to finish high school. Uh -huh. The best teacher now is to teach them to read, go to AETN, and they start there. That's the best curriculum for early childhood education. And if you can teach them on early childhood education on AETN, and I tested with my great grandbaby, she gets more off of AETN's curriculum than she does in the public school as a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. So spread that news out. <laughs> Use what you have. I remember when we used to have to have speed reading at EULA. Nearly everything that you watch on television now, there's a caption down there that you have to read it because everybody almost can speak English if we stay here long enough. And so that's speed reading. Have your child, your grandchild, your cousin, your nephew, the neighbor, your church member to get into practice of whatever they watch and they got that for the people that can't hear. Have them to read that out loud to you and see how fast they can read. That's how we're going to get it. The reason why I open up my library is that I'm like Elizabeth, she, she could open up hers too is that I brought back everything I ever had at any campaign, anything, but the most important thing are the books that have been written. This is what I've told people, and I've had them, John, I see you out there, that the thing about it is, this is how I read a book. A book is a conversation between me and the writer. And I don't read it from page one to page 300. I look down a table of contents and I decide I want to talk to you about what you think about this question. And so when folks see me with a thousand books or 1,500 funeral programs, they say, did you read all of them? I wasn't trying to read from one 300. That's what would kill your interest in reading, trying to read <laughs> from the first chapter to the 21st chapter. Read what you're interested in, in that book. And that's a conversation just like on the telephone with the writer. Thank you promise me you'll do that? Thank you. I'm looking for somebody who um, learns from DVDs. Mm -hmm. I'm 76, and I have bought a lot of history, and I don't have anybody to give the DVDs to. Um, I need to pass it on. Open I have knowledge. history of Euro European history, middle, mm -hmm. uh, middle, middle yeah. ages, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, 1789 to 1900. I have a lot of history. I hope somebody needs it. It's you. free. <laughs> I bet there's lots of people who would like it. <laughs> well, I believe in sharing. Sometimes when people come, and I remember the only time I made a mistake and shared my book, The Long Shadow of Daisy Bates, and she had written me a special note in it. And I loaned it to a trusted friend. 
And he said his children loaned it to some of their friends, and then the friends said they got, I, I didn't remember getting it shot. <laughs> I lost that precious archival piece. She's dead and gone, and I can't get her to sign another book. Well, I'm so old <laughs> that I need to start emptying my bookcases, and I need to um, give these DVDs to somebody maybe more than one somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, my name is Lee Irvin. I'm the chair of Culture Diversity here at the University of Arkansas Philanthropy Technical College. All right. Good. <laughs> all right. We'll make sure we connect you with you. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for this night, this evening, for listening to us. I learned a lot. I enjoyed myself tremendously. Good night.